All right. Okay, so thanks to everybody for, for logging on for the next in the series of Tech Talks. Uh, this month, we're going to look at uh, a practical course in containers with some Kubernetes thrown in. And uh, our presenters are uh, Jeff Sicka and Bob Killen from University of Michigan. So University of Michigan has been a long time uh, member of the Campus Champions community. Uh, my old buddy Brock Palin and I go back to the, the, the Terra Grid days, essentially. And uh, Jeff and, and Bob are I've, I think they've given this a couple of other times, and, and I believe this is a really get down to the nuts and bolts uh, talk on on using containers. And uh, I, for one, have, have really started using containers a lot, so I'm I'm at least extremely interested in smoothing out uh, my my deployment of containers and my usage. So I hope everybody's up for this. Uh, we're gonna for the first part during the presentation. If you have any questions, just type them in the chat box. But we're gonna try to hold uh, uh, questions until the uh, uh, the demo, which is the second half of this effort. So uh, if you do have a, a pertinent question uh, about the, the, the presentation, please go ahead and, and uh, uh, put it in the chat box. And other than that, we will uh, uh, wait till the demo portion to ask uh, some questions. And of course, it will be a Q&A session at the end as well. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. Marissa, is it cloud or computer? I already, I already started it. You're good. Oh, okay. okay, so we're recording now. Jeff and Bob, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so we actually haven't given this explicit tutorial before. This is sort of a pared down version of a much longer uh, set of tutorials that we do that encompass two days. Um, so th th this is very much going to be a sort of a lightning round version of it. That. Uh, my name is Bob Killen. I am a senior research cloud administrator for the University of Michigan. Uh, I am also a Cloud Native Computing Foundation ambassador. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation is sort of the uh, vendor neutral entity that sort of oversees the Kubernetes project and a whole bunch of other things. Sorry, we, ha we have to do a mute shuffle. Um, and my name is Jeffrey Sika. I also work for the University of Michigan ArcTS. Um, I happen to be a Kubernetes contributor. I am not a CNCF ambassador, and I'm not bitter about it. But you know, I just need to bring that up and point that out. Uh, so really, to talk about containers, we need to actually look at what an application is. Uh, an application has code. Uh, and that code needs a place to execute with all of its dependencies. Uh, if we're using Python, you're probably dealing with dependencies using pip. Um, you pip libraries might need an OS level library installed like libjpeg or libmysql. Um, and an application may or may not have potentially external dependencies or services like a backing data store or even a caching layer or file systems. Uh, a container is really meant to package everything required to run an application and make it easy to distribute, also known as a shipping container. But um, containers are meant to contain things, uh, and many incorrectly believe that putting things in a container makes them more secure. Uh, that is a fallacy. You still need to build your applications with security in mind. What I will say. Uh, compromising, yeah, sorry, compromising a monolith application is a lot more damaging than compromising a single microservice. And in that, microservice architecture can be more secure, but that's not saying that containers are more secure. It's an architecture difference. And you still need to think as an operator. Uh, the complexity has shifted. It hasn't gone away. So what a container isn't, a container is not a virtual machine. Docker and other container runtimes are not hypervisors. And there's an asterisk that Bob will get into. Uh, containers are not meant to be persistent. They are ephemeral by nature. If you were expecting a container to last forever, you are fundamentally using containers improperly. Uh, and they are, as I've said, not secure by default. They certainly allow you to build an application in a more secure fashion, but by default, if you just put something in Docker, it is not inherently more secure. Um, and actually, I'll cover it quick. To be technical, there, is, there are some container runtimes that actually spin up micro VMs. So 
Technically, container is not meant to be a VM, but there are runtimes that spin up VMs. I am complicating the issue, so I'm going to move on. Um, why are containers a thing? In one word, it's actually flexibility. Containers allow developers to build locally more easily. Uh, they can make testing easier, and then scaling becomes simpler when your application architecture is built right. And also, many of these workloads can now span multiple languages or even frameworks, uh, and entirely different teams can be working in entirely different sections of a project if you build them with containers and then plumb them together correctly. That's it. fundamentally that is microservice architecture. Um, why are containers a thing? Like I said, they're reproducible execution environments. They are easy to build and share, and it is trivial to connect the dots between containers and external services. This is microservice architecture fundamentals. So that really takes us to what, what is, is a container really? Oh, let me move myself okay. There we go. A container is a process with some additional properties and some voodoo magic uh, sort of behind the scenes, but they really are just a process. Containers share the kernel with the host. They have some isolation mechanisms, but they are essentially just a you know, sort of beefy seed root jail on steroids. Um, but because they are a process, they boot uh, just as if you were starting a normal process. That is, unless you're Java and you know, those take forever to start up. But normally it's you know, pretty much immediate and they can uh, boot essentially in uh, milliseconds. Um, and containers themselves, and at least the way how we use them today, they tend to be immutable. Um, this is, there's a little bit of a caveat on this as in like, you can technically do containers in a non-immutable way, but most, the way we tend to work with them day to day, uh, they are going to be an immutable, unchangeable object that makes it easy to distribute and start back up. Uh, essentially they are, you know, the whole idea of sort of cattle versus pets. We are, we, we don't want to manage a specific thing. We just want to start up and run and like as many instances of it, we want to be able to destroy as many instances of it and not have to worry about it. So, a container itself is uh, not just a single thing, but is a sort of an abstraction on top of multiple, uh, multiple underlying system capabilities, often referred, well, uh, often referred to as uh, namespaces. Um, I, they're listed there on the side, I'm not gonna dive into the little details of all of them, but in general, they are features of the Linux kernel and sort of control how certain things are exposed to a process itself. And combining how uh, it is sort of filtering that exposed data is how you get that level of isolation. Um, there are other things like uh, that are sort of similar in other operating systems, like in FreeBSD of jails, uh, but they are a single thing. Whereas in Linux, it's made up of a whole bunch of different components. Uh, you really don't need to know like in-depth knowledge of all this stuff, but having sort of that background information is very helpful as you dive more into the weeds of all of, of containers and how they'll work behind the scenes. The, the last thing is uh, when it comes to how we work with containers, at least day to day, um, in addition to Linux namespaces, they sort of load their apps and dependencies from a hierarchical layered file system. So when you grab like a container image or something like that, you're actually grabbing a bunch of different chunks that sort of map to sort of like diffs and things like that under, uh, under the hood, uh, which makes a lot of these sort of components like very, very usable. Now, be perfectly honest, I really hate this slide, but it's sort of like stereotypical and used all over the place. It's, it's a good demonstration of it. Um, with containers in general, um, there is no hypervisor overhead. Uh, you do not pay the performance price, uh, but you don't necessarily have the isolation boundary that, uh, that VMs provide. Um, and as Jeff touched on, there are some container runtimes that do sort of blur those lines. Um, I think it's uh, Amazon just released Firecracker not too long ago, which like has very, very minimal overhead, but you do get um, uh, VM level isolation. I'm going to talk more on that sort of like out of scope. So containers, at least the concept of containers have sort of been around for quite a while. Um, they are by no means a new concept. It all sort of started with, you know, CHROOT back in the day, and it's honestly still used today, uh, generally by like web hosting companies and things like that. 
and then you had BSD jails and Solaris zones, and they're sort of cousins to what we currently think of containers. And then in 2008, we started to see you know, more of what we know of today as containers and more usage of like day-to-day -day things and sort of like LXC, which sort of give you a way to like manage those namespaces, those Linux namespace capabilities in a more easy fashion. And then in you know 2013, Docker started to come around. Uh, Google released their containerizer. Let me uh, contain. Like, let me containerize that for you. Um, Docker certainly took off. Well, let me containerize that for you. Did not. And then we saw sort of a whole bunch of other container runtimes um, come about. Uh, Rocket. Um, God, what were some of the other ones? No, there, there were other ones at the time but they all sort of had like differing standards and other problems sort of in between them. They're all slightly different. Um, and then in 2015, a uh, bunch of the groups decided to get together and decide, hey, we're all trying to do the same thing and it'd be much easier if we sort of decided on the standard and they sort of got together and created the, the OCI initiative or Open Container Initiative. And with this, we sort of now have this agreed upon standard for container images, container runtime specs, and things like that. And it's allowed the community and tooling and a bunch of stuff to come up this like really flourish and take off. So with what we think of containers today, they sort of have a couple different components. Um, we have the runtime. This is the thing that's actually sort of handling the running of the container, of the container image or the instancing of it. Uh, we have the image itself, which is sort of this uh, distributable, immutable thing that you are uh, is being run by the container runtime, and then you have the container itself, sorry, which is that initial initialized version of that. Um, it's sort of if you're if we're with, like more programming aspects, an image is the definition of an object or like class, and a container is an instance of that object or class. Class, it is definition versus execution. So that like brings us to sort of what is Docker and Docker itself. And Docker these days is pretty much the de facto standard of container runtimes. Uh, in the research world, we do have other things like singularity, um, but in general, people will always compare it to Docker. Everyone's gonna be running Docker on their laptop. Um, it's what people are familiar with. And they definitely have the lion's share of the least market in terms of like developers and people using it. Uh, it was also very much built with the whole user developer experience in mind. Um, you know, originally, like Docker didn't do too much; it just made using LXC much easier to use. Um, so, like when when most people say container these days, they tend to think like Docker right along with it. And it also helps that it has some like very cute logos and things that are pretty memorable for people. Um, just make one big distinction, though is all the concepts, everything we've talked about so far, they are not uh, sort of runtime specific. And this talk will be touching on Docker, and we might refer to Docker, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use Docker. There are lots of other options out there. Um, again, there are other alternatives, and they can be you know, explored later. So if you're not familiar with Docker, here are just a few of the, the basic commands that we sort of see day to day. Uh, the first one is building an image itself. Um, this would take everything that's like in that current directory and sort of build into its little thing. The the second command is running or instant like instantiating a container and mapping port 80 to the host, port 80 to the container. Um, next is like getting the logs in the container, then executing uh, executing command within one, and then like deleting and deleting the image sort of behind it. Um, don't want to spend too much time going into, into that stuff, but it sort of just gives you an idea of how you would use it like at the command line. Microphone switch. All right, now that we have kind of touched on Docker and containers themselves, let's talk about container orchestration. Also known as Kubernetes most of the time. Um, containers are, all about packaging up your code and being able to ship it. But the question is, where are you gonna ship it? Uh, how can you actually run meaningful production container workloads? And one of the primary answers to that is Kubernetes. 
Um, one of the first questions that's al always asked is what Kubernetes actually means or stands for. Uh, it's Greek for pilot or helmsman of a ship, which makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, another thing is there's a common abbreviation of Kubernetes. It's K8S. That means K, there are eight more letters, and then S. Uh, it's a project that was spun out of Google as an open source container orchestration platform. Uh, it was built from lessons learned and the experiences of developing and running Google's internal container orchestration engines of Borg and Omega. Um, it was designed from the ground up as a loosely coupled collection of components that was centered around deploying, maintaining, and scaling these workloads. Um, so Kubernetes can actually do a lot. Uh, how I list a lot of different features here, but everything here requires some level of configuration. Uh, one of the big takeaways is Kubernetes configuration is declarative, not imperative. Uh, a good analogy is you tell Domino's that you want three pepperoni pizzas delivered to your house. You don't have to tell Domino's how to make the pizzas or the directions to your house. Domino's just knows that it's trying to get you three pepperoni pizzas at this address. And the single biggest value add that Kubernetes can offer is that it has the same API across bare metal and every cloud provider. Um, there are certain components in Kubernetes that will let you, say, provision a load balancer. And if you're running in Google, it knows to provision a Google cloud load balancer. Same with AWS, same with Azure. As far as Kubernetes is concerned, it is just provisioning this object. And then there is glue that uh, lets it connect to your cloud provider and do the right thing. Sorry, microphone switch again. So within Kubernetes, you have these sort of core concepts. These are the building blocks of primitives that much of Kubernetes actually builds on top of. And for practical purposes, we're only going to be covering pods and services a bit more. Um, but I'll touch on some of the other things here uh, just a little bit. Uh, with namespaces, they allow you to sort of carve up your Kubernetes cluster into logical chunks. Uh, think like a programming namespace uh, or in like, well, in application terms. You can also have different namespaces all running the sort of same application. Um, again, they, they sort of, they aren't necessarily an isolation boundary from each other, but they are a logical separation from each other. Uh, labels uh, sort of allow you to tag or annotate uh, Kubernetes objects with other meaningful information. Um, and this actually happens to be actionable information and that allow you to sort of create logical mappings between uh, different things. And these logical mappings are actually used by what's known as selectors, and they are the primary consumer of labels. So this takes us to the first thing I'll cover a bit more, and that's a pod. And a pod is the atomic unit or smallest unit of work in Kubernetes. And it actually allows you to uh, put one or more containers within a pod. And you might ask why yourself more than one container? Uh, you can actually have a sort of container, uh, or within a pod, you can have a separate container strap and perform some sort of form of initialization function. Or you might have a container that functions as a log or metric shipper. Um, we actually use a, uh, a practical example of that is we have a, I think it's um, Squid. Squid can, uh, has issues with like sending the logs directly to standard out and standard error. So we actually uh, run another container within the pod that is essentially syslog that captures the logs from squid and then dumps them to standard, out, standard error so they can be easily consumed by our, uh, the rest of our sort of you know, infrastructure logging and metrics collection system. And the reason why they can actually do that um, is the, the, all the containers within the pod actually are part of the same network uh, namespace. So you can have two containers when they, uh, within the same pod, and when they're thinking of local hosts, they are just talking to each other. Secondly, pods themselves are also ephemeral. ephemeral. Uh, their IP, host name, uh, everything else related to them is pretty much completely dynamic. Um, nothing about them is permanent. Uh, if you 
And you also don't actually like manage pods sort of directly. You, know, you actually use higher level objects that sort of manage them for you. And they, they handle the whole replica, replication fault tolerance and things like that. And we have services and services are sort of the unified method of accessing the exposed workloads of pods. Um, I know it's kind of a bit uh, like a big sentence to swallow and it might not make a lot of sense, but whereas pods are dynamic objects and they have no nothing static about them, services are that static object. So a service gets a cluster wide unique IP and DNS name and they then use labels and selectors to target the pods. Um, so they are sort of like an internal mapping or internal load balancer. So I have, let's say, a couple web servers, um, and they're all labeled with something. I can have a service that targets those labels, and everything inside my cluster can refer to the DNS name or IP of that service, and they'll always be able to reach a pod. It also means that I can scale those pods uh, up and down uh, quite a bit, and I will still be able to use that durable service object. Lastly, they are not ephemeral. ephemeral. So they are the persistent version sort of of a, a pod, I should say. They're, well, not a persistent version of a pod, but they are the persistent object that points to the ephemeral object of the pod. Or pods are dynamic, services are static. And to sort of demonstrate all this stuff, we will kick off over to Minikube, which is a handy little single node uh, Kubernetes cluster that you can boot a variety of uh, provide, like virtualization providers. Um, I think you can actually do it natively on the host with like VM driver none if you happen to be running Linux. But the nice thing is this gives you a nice uh, way to just spin up and play with Kubernetes in a fashion that you know won't cost you money. <laughs> Microphone switch. Thank you, Bob. So what is an application? Like I said earlier, an application has code and the code needs a place to execute with all of its dependencies. And in many cases, those apps may have to connect to some external data store or something in the background, you know, just connect elsewhere. So realistically, you can put your application in a container and package everything up so you can distribute it wherever you need to go. Um, like we said, Docker is the foremost container runtime, but none of the concepts that we've talked about, none of the concepts that we're gonna demo are specific to Docker. Uh, all of them have these fundamental concepts. Uh, and Kubernetes is where you would take your container and try and run it in a production sort of fashion. Um, and it doesn't matter what cloud you're running in, Kubernetes will be able to handle it. Um, and lastly, Minikube is a way for you to spin up a Kubernetes cluster locally and do your development. So not only can your developers you know, build your application and also potentially build the container, they can also spin up an entire stack locally, including Kubernetes, and ensure that everything is working correctly. Um, like some people may have heard at the beginning of the call before we actually started. Uh, this is a very, very pared down version of the first two talks. These uh, introduction to containers and introduction to Kubernetes are each full day tutorials that we run. Uh, and then Katakoda is another online uh, tutorial and resource that has a just a wealth of knowledge that people can use. Uh, we will make sure that these slides are available so that you can get these links and take a look for yourself. Hey, uh, I, uh, could I back you up one slide just real quick? Apologize for, for uh, forward one. There you go. So yep. for the people on the call, and, and we'll put this in the, the talk notes, but I think it's important to uh, recite the University of Michigan and, the, and these uh, reference materials. If, if anybody on the call uh, decides to use these tutorials, please drop uh, Bob or Jeff a note and let them know that, that uh, you use them. So uh, the University of Mission group can, can go ahead and cite the, the, the usage of these. That helps uh, them uh, justify making additional reference materials. So we'd all certainly appreciate it if you uh, uh, let them know if you use these. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, PRs are also welcome. Uh, everything's up in GitHub. And everything is licensed under Creative Commons. So if you want to take anything for 
your own presentations or intro work, please feel free to do so. Uh, likewise, Bob and I have no real problem coming around and giving these talks. Uh, we've given these talks at Supercomputing, uh, Internet 2 Tech Exchange, uh, several different places. I, yeah, several different places. There was a cloud forum that I gave a five minute version of, which was kind of fun and crazy. But I believe it is demo time. Um, if there are any questions, yeah, if there are any questions, um, please feel free to ask them now. I will also be just kind of hacking through taking a Python app, putting it in a container, going over everything that I'm doing, and then also putting it into Kubernetes and everything that I'm doing. It's, it's meant to be a cute, small little demo, but realistically, it's just a way to have other people ask questions or, you know, be a thought-provoking thing. What is a microservice? Um, so there is a, there's a common uh, term of monolith, and then there's a common term of microservice. Monolith is think every, every possible component of your app is in a single code base running on a single, uh, running in a single application. So think uh, your login logic, um, your reporting logic, um, it, Looking at it a different way, microservices are taking all of the logical components and functions of an application and breaking them into their own individual uh, running applications. And that can do a lot of different things. One of the big reasons why a microservice architecture came out originally was scalability. If you would profile your application and all of a sudden you realize that logins are taking you know two seconds but all the other page loads are taking 50 milliseconds you'd want to scale up your login logic you know and have say you know a hundred instances of a login server but only five instances of your application server you can't really do that unless you decouple those uh pieces of your application and that's the concept of a microservice uh what are well, what is the computational overhead of running microservices, microservices via Docker and Kubernetes? Um, there is some overhead with Kubernetes itself. There is an agent that you have to run on the host. Uh, other than that, it's really not much of an overhead. Um, Kubernetes itself can be a little chatty, uh, depending on how much you're monitoring and some of the other things done by your, or how you have the kubelet, sort of the agent configured. Um, it can consume, like I think on, on many cube, it's like 10% of one CPU. But that's if you're like, that's also running all the control plane services and things like that. Um, so in addition to just sort of the general sort of pod or container overhead, uh, when you're using a container orchestration system, there's a whole bunch of sort of services that are needed to run and manage it. But one, one thing to be clear, running containers themselves, just containers, not t talking about Kubernetes, there is minimal overhead. And the entire reason for that is you're not having to deal with a hypervisor or a virtual machine. It's all running, it's a process running on the same host. And the container runtime engine itself is extremely minimal. As, as Bob is typing, it's just a process in isolation. Um, if there are no other questions, I will pop open to a code editor and you guys can watch me uh, just hack on VS code for a little bit. So, how do I minimize that zoom bar? I'll work around it. Um, so what we have here is a fairly simple Python app. Uh, our Python app just has Flask and Redis as external libraries. And what our Python app will do is it will load a page and show how many hits we have uh, seen on this page. And it tracks the hits within Redis. So extremely simple, you know, database server web app type thing. Um, we are, we have built it so it is looking for a host, a Redis host that has a DNS record of Redis. It is looking at port 6379, which is the default of Redis, and it will be serving on port 8080. And it will give the, the old hello world I've been seeing X number of times. Um, I want to minimize that so bad. 
Jeff, do you know how to minimize the uh, the zoom bar at the top? I do not right off. I'm kind of looking around myself. Optimize for full screen video clip. Disable attendee annotation. All right, I, I will just uh, do this. <laughs> okay. Boom. Good. Sounds good. So uh, this is our Python app in a nutshell. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is build a Docker file. Um, for the sake of time, I have gone ahead and done this. This is also the same demo app that we use during uh, the Intro to Containers tutorial, so I already have it here. Um, but I'm going to go through this line by line so you can kind of see what each line is meant for and the logic behind it. So the first line is from. Uh, in a Docker file, you can inherit other pre-built images. So a lot of larger companies and projects have pre-built images that you can build on top of. In this case, I'm using Python. Um, and there are different types of container image OSs. Um, like there's an Ubuntu image that you can build on top of. Um, there's a Red Hat image you can build on top of. Um, but those uh, operating system images tend to be quote unquote larger than you need. Um, so other different container OSs have come around like Alpine, where it is an extremely minimal bare bone operating system for uh, the container to run. In. And Bob is going to do a bunch of typing to correct anything that I say wrong because I tend to be wrong. Just kidding. But anyways, um, to put it into perspective, uh, a base Ubuntu uh, image might be 60 megabytes, or as an Alpine image might be five. So it's a significant difference. And one thing to consider is if, if you were at a very large scale or think like HPC scale where you have say a thousand machines and they're all trying to download an image, it's a lot easier and better for your network health to download a five megabyte image than it is to download a 50 megabyte image. And that's just like the base operating system. We, we aren't even talking about what uh, libraries you might have to package into your container. So a lot of the times you'll see people using uh, an Alpine based container. Um, so this is the actual container name. And then this is a tag. Uh, you can build images and tag them with various different tags. A common one is latest, and that's usually the most recent instance of an image that's been built. Um, so next what we want to do is copy everything that is in the current working directory and put it into slash code. Uh, when you run, if you remember uh, the slide that we had, the different Docker commands, you'll run something like Docker build hyphen T something, and then period. That period is the current working directory. And likewise, this will look in that current working directory and copy everything into slash code. So if you hopefully can see, that means everything in the app directory will wind up in slash code when we build this. Um, so next we have WorkDire, which is, oh, I love VS Code, um, WorkDire, tells the, uh, the image what directory you should uh, immediately be executing in. So if we build this container and then we exec into it or we run it and tell it to run like bash or shell, it will start everything in slash code. Uh, next we have the run command, which actually executes whatever shell commands that we have here uh, in the container and stores everything that occurs in that layer. So one thing that I don't think I said and should have is each of these lines creates a diff or a layer in the image file system. Those, that was that hierarchical layer file system that I was referencing earlier in the presentation. Uh, this sort of goes back to the hierarchical layer file system uh, that you're talking about earlier in the presentation. Um, so if I have multiple images that are based off the Python Alpine image, this Python Alpine, uh, this Python Alpine image, blah, can't talk, would only exist once on disk. And anything after that would be able to reuse it. Yeah. So each of these lines creates a different um, layer in this hierarchical file system that gets you know, flattened into a single 
uh, file system when it runs. Uh, so in this case, what's happening is we are running pip install. Uh, we're installing all of our dependencies for our application, which I will pop open in a second. And then all of those or all of those dependencies will get saved into that intermediate layer and then committed to that layer. We're, we're kind of getting into some of the weeds. Most of the time when you are really developing with containers, you're not worrying about, you know, this is, this is a layer and thinking about what layers to inherit. Um, but it is worth noting these uh, specifics just for an academic purpose, essentially. Um, and then the last line in our Docker file is the CMD line. Um, what this does is this tells the container or the image itself what command to run when it, the image is run as a container. Uh, in this case, we are running just Python app.py. I actually want that to be Python 3 just to be safe. Um, so whenever we do like a Docker run and invoke this image, that is going to run Python 3 app.py. And app.py should reside within slash code because we're copying that in. Um, as far as our requirements, do I have it open? There we go. Uh, like I said, simple app, we just want it to install Flask and we want it to install Redis. Oh, um, Docker build. So first, we're in the right directory. Docker build hyphen T test app dot. So I'm saying Docker, please build an image. I want it tagged as test app. I could also do something like test app um, fun, but that's another way you can tag images with those tags. Uh, and then I'm telling it to look for a Docker file in the current working directory, which is period. Uh, you could also have Docker files in separate directories and then you just have to specify um, which directory to look at. And you can also also specify a different file other than the pronounced name of Docker file. It, it always looks for this file unless you specify the hyphen F flag and then you can specify whatever file you want. But again, for the most part, these generic uh, commands are what you're using 99% of the time. So, Right now, hopefully it isn't going to nuke my connection. I'd laugh if it does. Uh, but it is downloading the Alpine container image. Um, I'm going to scroll up, and then we'll kind of scroll down as things go. Um, so it pulled down the Alpine container image, and it had that sort of hash for that file layer. Uh, it copied in everything in the current working directory to slash code and generated that container file layer, or image file layer. Uh, work dire, same. Um, notice it's removing an intermediate container because this isn't actually uh, a, a changed file. Uh, then it's running pip install and installing everything via pip. Uh, it set the command to be python3 app.py and then hey, we now have test app. And if you don't specify a tag, everything will automatically be set as uh, latest. So now, uh, hyphen I is an interactive session, hyphen T is just TTY, uh, making a TTY session. Uh, I can run this and everything will work. Except it actually won't because if we go, well, two things. One, I did not expose the port. So if you want to expose a port in Docker, you have to specify. E8080, the, uh, the port on your host, and then the port within the container. Now, if I go to my browser, it still doesn't work. Because you're doing it in Minikube. Because I'm doing it in Minikube. Thank you, Bob. Oh. Well, it actually, the point was it isn't going to work anyways because we don't have Redis running. Um, so what we're going to do is what I said I wasn't going to do. I'm going to spin up Docker to make things faster because I just noticed the time. Uh, we are going to look at Docker Compose. So one of the things that we've been talking about is just how to convert your app from a you know, simple Python app to a Docker container. 
and we've gotten that far, but how do we actually test this app with an instance of Redis? Well, there's already images of Redis available, so we should be able to spin up multiple containers and have those containers talk to each other in some meaningful fashion. Um, that is what Docker Compose is all about. Uh, Docker Compose is a utility that has come out of Docker that lets you define multi-container workloads uh, in a single YAML file, which I'll go over, and spin everything up, build the container if it needs to be built, and plumb it all together so you can actually work with it. Uh, let me make sure that... I'm going to stop mini key. And I'm going to create a new terminal. Sorry about that. Good. So we have just normal Docker stuff running. Let's spin up multiple containers. Um, so in a Docker Compose YAML file, what you do is you define what are called services. Really, they're just different containers running. In this case, we are defining a web container. Um, you can either tell it to build a container or use a pre-existing container. In this case, we are saying, hey, look for a Docker file and automatically build it in the current working directory. This looks really similar to the command I just ran. It's because it is. It's just looking for the same things and doing the same commands. Uh, it's telling it to expose port 8080 from port 8080. Uh, one different thing that we haven't touched on is it's actually going to mount the current working directory into the container. This is especially useful if you're doing things like web development where you're changing HTML files all the time and you, know, you don't want to have to rebuild the container and run it over and over again. Instead, you can just mount your uh, code directory or directories within the container and then It'll, the changes will happen within the container automatically. <clears throat> and then additionally in here, we're saying we want to spin up a service called Redis. And we just want it to have an image uh, that is tagged Redis colon Alpine. Again, Alpine because of the lightweight container image. So what's gonna happen is when I do this Docker Compose up, it's gonna first build and start the web application, then it is going to start the Redis application. And because we've named these services like this, uh, they can actually talk to each other as if they're on the same network. So in our application code, we're saying look for a host name of Redis, it'll be able to resolve that and talk. So, um, Notice how this build is happening a little bit faster. That's because the Alpine image already existed on my machine. Um, but there are some operations that will always happen even if there are um, layers that exist. Things like if you happen to be installing libraries or in this case, you know, doing a pip install, it'll automatically do that. So uh, we now have an application running on port 8080. Hello world. I've been seeing one, two, three, four, a whole bunch of times. Um, for the sake of time, because I honestly forgot about talking or doing Docker Compose with uh, Minikube, because that's a little difficult and I will explain why. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is just go over translating the Docker Compose file that I just ran into a Kubernetes deployment script. So we have like I said, this simple definition of an application with web and with Redis. Are there any questions? Bob? Okay. Um, so we have this that we can run, uh, we have this application that we can run locally. Now let's try and you know, take it and run it on Kubernetes. Um, so first we have to define what's called a deployment. Earlier in the presentation, we talked about pods and how higher level objects tend to manage uh, replication and fault tolerance. Uh, one of those higher level objects is called a deployment. And all a deployment really is, is defining what container or containers you want running, and it will ensure that the amount of containers that you want running are always running. Um, 
Uh, someone has asked uh, why, or Bob wants me to explain why I would want to use Kubernetes over Docker Compose. Um, Docker Compose is really meant to be a smaller scale and more of a local testing tool and development tool. Um, Kubernetes provides a lot more. It provides things like health checking, it provides blue-green deployments, and it provides scaling. Whereas Docker Compose at its core is really just a nice way to spin up multi-container workloads and test them locally. Um, and I will ask Bob, why do you think you should use Docker or Kubernetes over Docker Swarm? Uh, Swarm is Docker sort of built in orchestration engine, but it is very simple and lacks a lot of things that Kubernetes does um, sort of inbuilt and natively. And many things also offer much better integration with Kubernetes over uh, Swarm and Compose. Perfect. for the same. Okay, um, so this is a Kubernetes deployment script. Um, briefly going over line by line, uh, everything in Kubernetes, and I mean everything in Kubernetes, is an API object. It's one of the awesome things about Kubernetes. So also everything is an, a versioned API. In this case, and this is actually an old version because it's apps v1, I believe. Uh, a deployment is uh, an object within the apps v1 API in Kubernetes. Um, most of the time you template all of this out and you don't have to keep this memorized, but it's one of those, I've done it so many times, you just happen to know it. Um, so everything in Kubernetes is an object and everything can also have some metadata. Uh, typically, you have to name your uh, API object. In this case, we're naming this deployment demo app. And you don't always have to specify a namespace, um, at least in your script. But depending on where you're executing it, um, it will know which namespace it is. So in this case, we're saying there's a namespace called shared, and we want the deployment to exist in that namespace. And now we have hit the spec portion of the deployment. Uh, a spec is kind of the actual, uh, remember how I said, order three pizzas, bring it to my house? This is where you're saying, I want three pizzas and where, you know, where my house is. So I will have a single instance of my container running, and then I want to ensure that the pods that this deployment creates have a label of app equals demo app. And then down here, you actually have a, what's called a pod spec. So higher level objects will have specs of lower level objects because they need to know what to spin up and then you know, manage. So while we just defined our deployment up here, now we're actually defining the pod that we want the deployment to manage. So in this case, we have a pod that is a single container. This container has a name of demo. Within a pod spec, you have to name your containers because you can have multiple containers within a pod. Uh, we want it to use this image. Uh, in this case, it was gonna be developer workflow demo. And then there is this concept of an image pull policy. Uh, you can, within Kubernetes, say, always pull an image no matter what, and then if the, a new version of a tagged image is, exists, it will automatically pull it. Uh, in some instances, you don't want that. You want to always be pinned to a specific image that you manage. That's fine, too. There are many different uh, settings for image pull policy. And then we're saying, hey, there is an application that is running on port 8080 within this container. And that will specify our deployment. But pod deployments spin up pods, and pods are inherently ephemeral. How would we have Kubernetes point to those pods? Like we said, we need to create a service. So in this case, we create a service. We happen to name the service demo app, but note that I didn't specify a namespace here. Technically, we don't need to because if we were executing the script within the shared namespace, it'll exist in the correct namespace. Uh, and in a service spec, we have defined what ports we're using. Uh, so we name this port 8080. And we are going to expose on the service port 8080, which is targeting the pods port 8080. And then 
going back to labels and selectors, we want the service to select all pods that have a label of app equals demo app. And had I not been a dum dum and killed Docker and spun up Minikube and done all of that trying to be smart, I would have been able to demo this. But since we have seven minutes, I would rather have people ask questions. So if there are any questions, please let me know. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. I've, I've actually picked up a lot of information. I'm going to, as soon as this call's over with, I'm going to tinker with a bit more before I for, forget it. So, uh, yes, definitely. I, I, we've got 60 people on the call. Uh, I'm sure a number of them are working. Oh, there we go right there. Sandeep's got a question about, can you use Singularity containers with Kubernetes? Uh, yes, I believe it is in alpha or beta. Uh, they just released version 3 uh, point something recently that supported they talked about supporting it at SUG uh, not too long ago. There are caveats with running it and you must be running a very recent version of Kubernetes. Okay. Others? So one of the things I really like about the, the container container situation, most of the work I do research-wise involves uh, bioinformatics pipelines. And, and compared to the old monolithic days of, of config make, make install, you know, for a single binary, this bioinformatics stuff is, is just a nightmare, you know, because uh, it, it involves multiple tools and those tools have uh, uh, requirements and dependencies. So uh, I've been using Bioconda quite a lot to install tools locally on my Mac, but I uh, found that uh, often in cases uh, it's just as easy or maybe even easier and more efficient to use a, a, a container that's been, uh, it, you know, it's got a spec file built for it. It makes doing these really complicated uh, workflows so much easier. There's actually a project called BioContainers where they've packaged up a lot of the more commonly used bioinformatics applications. And you can just pull from there and use them sort of off the shelf or base your own stuff off of it. Yep, that thing's been invaluable. It's, it's just a great way to subvert days of, building individual packages and trying to link them together. Oh yeah. Um, let's have a question. Uh, how to run a production on-premise Kubernetes cluster? That is sort of um, depends on the way you want to go about it. There is multiple sort of distributions available for running it on-premise um, that you sort of have to weigh the pros and cons of running each one of them or for us, um, both Jeff and I are sort of upstream Kubernetes contributors. Uh, we're very familiar with it. We sort of just run the upstream version using a project called kubeadm, which sort of lets you deploy and manage your own thing. Uh, there's others out there such as Rancher, which sort of handle a lot of the lifecycle management of the cluster itself a lot easier. Uh, there's also Red Hat's OpenShift uh, and several other projects out there like uh, Suze has their own version, Ubuntu has their own version. Uh, there is a general project out there, or not project, initiative out there from the CNCF uh, that essentially certify versions of Kubernetes uh, that all these vendors are running. Uh, so essentially, do it, does this distribution of it like match all the API specs? Uh, so like you have some level of you know, trust, I guess is the, is the word for it, or that you know, what I build will run here. And if it runs uh, here, it will also run in any of the other providers that have sort of passed the conformance test. More questions? Oh, there we go. Uh, can I run a Linux distro on my Mac with this instead of having to use a VM? Um, you are still sort of using a VM under the hood on OS X. Like it uses like XHive, I think now, but it's still a virtualization system. Um, unfortunately, it's sort of the, the, the limitation, like you're going to run to either running OS X uh, or Windows. Um, it does sort of make the experience using it nicer, um, at least if you don't need like desktop components of it. I also kind of like this uh, philosophy of, of uh, doing something in a container kind of reminds me a little bit of a lightweight kernel environment in, in a Cray system, you know, where you've uh, especially with Alpine, you can get down to, to kind of a minimal uh, install, and and you're you can you can even tune that and focus on specifically running your app and not having so much overhead for things you would never want or, or need. Yep, uh, there's actually been a big initiative called Distroless or Scratch, 
where they will like essentially strip out every unneeded dependency outside of the like just the libraries and things that are needed to run the application itself. I like it. Oh, uh, when doing Docker build, where is the image file stored? Uh, the image file is stored locally on whatever machine the uh, image is being built. There is this concept of building and then pushing uh, images. Um, there are image registries. Google has one. Docker has one. Um, there's an open, uh, not an open source one, but a third party one called Quay. Um, but they're stored locally. Bob just put the uh, where the images are typically stored. Um, with less than two minutes left, what I want to explain what I just did. Uh, I spun up Minikube again on my laptop. Uh, Minikube is a virtual machine, but it also has to have an instance of Docker running. One of the weird, cool things you can do is you can have the Docker client running on your machine point to the Docker server in Minikube, which is what I have right now. Um, so in a new window, if I did Docker PS, it's just going to show up nothing because my local instance of Docker doesn't have anything running. But since this is the Minikube version, I can do a Docker PS and see all of the Kubernetes components that happen to be running. Likewise, you can then have uh, your images built in the Minikube virtual machine, which helps with development significantly. So, uh, deployment. I am missing a field selector because I wrote that by hand and I don't remember. And yes, you don't have to run two VMs that way. Uh, I think Bob is gonna pull that up and I am not going to try and debug it with zero seconds left. It is now three o'clock my time. Uh, if there are any other questions, um, we will share the slides and we will make sure that our contact info is available for anyone and everyone because we just love talking about this stuff. It's fun for us. So do not feel, do not be shy and don't worry about reaching out to us, even with silly small questions. Everyone has to start somewhere. Uh, other little thing to note, there is an actual academic channel in the CNCF Slack. Uh, it's pretty quiet, but most of the people in there are all essentially people trying to do, you know, exactly what you're all here doing. Um, there's uh, some people from CERN, a good amount of researchers, and other groups there, and they're just a good group to bounce questions off of. That sounds great, guys. We really appreciate it, and, and I think everybody's gleaned a whole lot of uh, useful information from this talk. I hope everybody goes back and starts tinkering on their desktop with uh, Kubernetes and and containers and and uh, Certainly seems like uh, we're going to see a lot more of this in the very near future in the, the research computing space. So uh, better sooner than later. And uh, Marissa and I will make uh, the, the uh, recording available as well as the slides from Jeff and Bob's talk. And uh, we thank everybody for showing up today for the, the, the meeting. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot, all. Thanks. I'm going to stop the recording now, Jeff. Okay.